Well, I guess these guys thought that John the Baptist was a country bumpkin, and that's okay. But uh, I kind of like that perspective because imagine you sitting, whittling a stick on the porch, thinking about your life, looking back and reflecting on your life. What would the anthem be? What would the message be about your life? What would be said about you, who you are, what you stood for? You know, John the Baptist was this man who courageously stood up to evil. Today we're looking at Mark chapter 6, and we're going to see how he speaks out against some really evil stuff that's going on. I don't know if you've ever been put in a position like that, where you've had to stand up for something, maybe stand up for someone, where you've had to speak out against something. When I was 19 years old, I was working at a local restaurant here in town, and I remember a young girl on staff coming up to me and telling me that our boss had harassed her. And I thought to myself, what am I to do with this information? I had to go report him to HR. I had to look her in the eyes and tell her that I would stand up for her. I had to address my boss this entire time. And HR took care of things and justice was served. We found out that he was really harassing other girls on staff as well. But I remember being so afraid of standing up for what's right because I was afraid I was going to lose something. I was going to afraid I was going to lose a relationship that I had with my boss that I really did like and admired and respected and I enjoyed spending time with. I don't know if you've ever been put in a position where you had to stand up for something that is right when it will cost you something greatly. We've all been put in moments in our lives of opportunities for courage to step forward and take over. But I think John the Baptist was a man that was able to speak out against evil because he lived a life every single day dedicated to God. In fact, I believe that John the Baptist was a man who every single day practiced what he preached. And as a result, when that moment came, he didn't have to work up the courage to stand up for what is right. It was ingrained in who he was as a person. It was given to him through his relationship with God. So if you have your Bibles open uh, with me to Mark chapter 6, verse 14, it's on page 841 on the Bibles we give away on our two different tables in here and out by the coffee and donuts. And the story of John the Baptist's death goes like this. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Now, the word about Jesus has really gotten out. It's spread like rapid fire. Many people are hearing about this miracle worker. And word has gotten back to King Herod. Herod was a ruler over this area. He was from Rome. He was given jurisdiction over this area. And as this great ruler, word about what's going on comes to him. This is Herod Antipas. He is the son of Herod the Great, okay? He is the one who will stand face to face with Jesus and present him in front of the crowds that will say, crucify him, crucify him. This is the very same Herod. And he has heard about Jesus. Word has gotten to him. And the, the word is traveling like, who is this man, really? They're wondering, is, is he maybe John the Baptist? And they are wondering, in fact, to see this one who is preaching this repentance, who is set apart, who is off in the wilderness, this different person. Could he be a prophet of old, maybe someone from the Old Testament like Elijah. They couldn't attribute to him that he was actually the saving one, the Messiah. No, they had to attribute it, him to someone else, someone that they've seen a proven track record with. And Herod says, well, maybe it is John the Baptist, the one that I beheaded. Now, here's a transition that's going to take place in Mark chapter 6. It's having a flashback moment. Mark, the author here of this gospel, is all about power pack action. He gives it in a quick, tied-up story. Uh, he is writing to the Roman audience. We're going to see even in this passage words like executioner that tie into the Romans that give us insight to him writing to this group of people. And, and so Mark does this little flashback now as he writes this story. He tells about the death of of John the Baptist. Verse 17 says, For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herod's 
his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herod is keeping John safe. And here's where he's keeping him safe. In prison. He's put him in prison. Luke chapter 3 tells us about that. He's put him in prison. It's in the northeast shore of the Dead Sea. And you're thinking, wow, all right. He gets to hang out, have an ocean view. Maybe they got some weights in this prison. Got some cable TV going on. Gluten-free menu. Like, he's got it made. No, the view that overlooked the Dead Sea was a constant reminder of the state of those prisoners. That there was no hope, that there was no light. The Dead Sea was so filled with saline that nothing can live there. It's so salt filled that nothing can survive within its waters. And this reminder to the prisoners was a reminder that there was no real hope for them. And so John the Baptist is being kept safe by Herod in this prison. And why is he put into prison? Because of the one he marries. See, Herod was already married before. He had married an Arabian king's daughter. And Herod was married before as well. Philip, brother, this is a weird incestual relationship that forms. It's a familial marriage that takes place. They, they have to, in fact, break up with their current spouses so that they too can be <coughs> together. And John the Baptist says, that's wrong. That's sin. And he is holding this leader to a higher standard. And John the Baptist had uh, a way with his words with Herod. Herod really fell in love with listening to the words of John the Baptist. He was in amazement with him, but it didn't translate into transformation for him or Herod. Look at verse 19. It says that she had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not. For Herod feared John. Knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, he kept him safe. When he had heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. I find it amazing that you can come face to face with a man that's preaching a message of repentance. You can almost fall in love with the delivery, or you can fall in love with what's being said. But it never changes you. It never transforms you. So Herod cared about this guy. Enough to save his life. But to put him in prison. Verse 21 came. This is where the story gets crazy, okay? This is where it puts Vegas to shame, okay? This is where the party unleashes, all right? If you've got children, there's going to be some earmuffs moments on this story, okay? If you think the Bible's boring, you're crazy, all right? <laughs> Verse 21, an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. So Herod is throwing a banquet for all of these incredibly influential people to celebrate his birthday. This is his birthday party, but it's not at McDonald's. Okay? There's no cute frozen invitation to this birthday party. This is a wild drunken, sex-driven party. Verse 22 says, When Herod's daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. i got to fill you in here, okay? Because when we read stories like this, I'm not so sure it really sinks in as to what's taking place. Herod, who marries his brother's wife and now has a new stepdaughter, brings her into the party with all the other dancing girls to dance for all of the men in town. All of the high-ranking officials, the civil leaders, the community leaders, this is the party that's taking place. And she is a teenage girl. She's not a woman. She was a young teenage girl. So this is sick. This is twisted. This is wrong. This is sick and wrong. 
This is gross. And this party taking, off, taking place. Verse 23. He then vows to her. Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. This is how you know they're drunk. <laughs> hey, whatever you ask me, I'll give it to you. Up to half my kingdom. Right? He wasn't like, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you. He is not in his right mind. He is so drunk. He is so crazy right now. He's going to give up half of his kingdom to this dancing little teenage girl. So she's thinking on her feet, and she's so young, she's got to go run to mom and ask her. Verse 24, it says, when she went out, and she said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Uh -huh. The record stops. The music comes to a halt. The party has got its attention on this young girl's request. We've been drinking, we've been dancing, we've been partying. And my request to fulfill the vow that you've made in front of all of these people, when your word is your bond in this day, you've got to come through for me. I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter immediately. Right away. Verse 26, and the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison. And he brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. Okay, this is the party. Executioner, go to the prison. Take care of business. And he does. And he's not running a harbor freight to get some new blades on his sawzaw here. This is ancient times <coughs> where he is using dull instruments to take the head off of John the Baptist. Gruesome, wild, crazy story. And if that's not enough, he's got to come in with that head, with blood still dripping, to the party on a platter to present. Yay, what a party, right? And you can see the devastation over the disciples of John the Baptist. Verse 29 says, When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. They come. You can only imagine them saying, what? Really? How? Why? John the Baptist? He's never done anything to deserve such a gruesome death. Now maybe Herod, maybe his crazy wife, maybe the executioner, Maybe some of those are deserving of a death like that, but not John the Baptist. What did John the Baptist do that was so atrocious that he needed to die for it? He stood up. He spoke out. He called sin, sin, and he called people to repent from it. This is John the Baptist, the guy who in the moment that is presented in front of him, where he has to speak out and face rejection, the courage within him has been built from a lifetime of serving God. Let's look a little deeper at who John the Baptist is, okay? If you've got your Bibles, you can go to Luke, okay? It's another gospel, Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 6, and we're going to look at verse 13 in Luke chapter 1. And verse 6 tells us about his heritage. Tells us about his family. This is who he comes from. A family that has loved God and serving God and stands for God. Verse 6 says, And they, talking about his parents, were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. Okay, they weren't picking and choosing which ones they could follow. 
They weren't following the commandments of the Lord that they felt met their needs. They weren't saying, okay, I like this commandment, but this one, uh, that's off limits, okay, God, you can't really have that part of my life. There was no secret doors into rooms that they, that they were not allowing God into, okay? Everything in their house was open to God. Their life was open to God. They followed God. They served God. Look at verse 13 with me. It says, but an angel said to him, okay, this is John the Baptist who knows these Parents that love God and love him. And now he's getting to remember and hear stories about their interactions with God. One in particular, an angel coming to his father, Zechariah, and saying, For your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Time and time again, John the Baptist was reflecting upon growing up in a home that was dedicated to God. He had the privilege and the opportunity to come up in a home that served the Lord. And John the Baptist for himself made that decision to follow God and to serve him. In fact, he would be one that would baptize and lead people to repentance. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, tell of the call of repentance through baptism that John says. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And it says... That he, he would preach this message to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's saying come to repentance because for this he is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. When he said the voice of the one crying in the wilderness prepare a way for the Lord. Make straight his paths. See John the Baptist preached a message of repentance. He preached a message of repentance and fulfillment of the call on his life. The prophecy to be the one to point others to Jesus. That's really what his life was all about. And, you know, his, his vision for his life, I believe, was very clear. He knew what he was about. John 3, 30 says, for he must increase and I must decrease. That was really the vision of John's life. What he was really known for was baptizing. He would baptize people as a symbolic gesture of cleansing, of washing and renewal. But he would also baptize people in repentance to turn from their sins and to turn to God. This was a baptism called proselyte baptism. This is before Jesus, all right? Because when we get in the waters of the baptismal tank here, we are publicly proclaiming that we identify ourselves as a Christian, that we love God and we serve God, that we are followers of Jesus. So... For John, he was baptizing people into the Jewish faith. It, it was found in Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah, the, the kind of picture here uh, of this baptism that would take place was in Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 16, it says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Verse 17, you cease to do evil, and here's what you do. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the case or the cause of the widows. And come, let us talk these together, saying, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they shall become like wool. This is the message of repentance that, that John would call people to. To give over their lives to God. To seek forgiveness from God. To serve God. And that's what a life that says... He must increase and I must decrease looks like. When you're willing to stand up against what's wrong, even if you face rejection, you're going to have a life that is bigger than yourself. And John the Baptist certainly did. He had a vision of his life to make God more and him less. He said, I'm yours, God. I'll be your servant. You know, here at Anchor Church, we have a vision. I mean, this is really why we exist. Okay, we want to see lives transformed by Jesus, for Jesus. Now, there's going to be times where we say, okay, we want to go to three services. Or we want to go to uh, build a building. You know, we're going to cast vision for things like that. But overall, why we do what we do is to see Jesus transform lives. Okay, as a family, I have a vision for our family. My wife and I, a couple years back after a sermon we did here, we, we made a commitment to come up with a vision. And I like sharing it. I've shared it many times. But... We want to love God passionately. That's our family vision. We want to love God passionately. We want to just ooze out a passionate love for God. Not a perfect one, uh, but we want to love God passionately. 
We want to serve others joyfully. That it's like our, our joy, Chick-fil-A motto of our lives. It's my <laughs> pleasure to serve you. We, we want to serve others joyfully. And we want to have a lot of fun making memories together. Okay, so when our kids grow up, that's what we want them to say. You know what? This is why we did what we did. Because we love God passionately, we served others joyfully, and we had a lot of fun together doing it. But you know, I sat down this week, and I'm studying this message, and I really got to thinking, I got to thinking, this passage is really not as much about John's death as it is about his life. Okay, sure, it's the description of how he died. But why did he die? <clears throat> That's the bigger question. Why did he die? He died because of the life that he lived. I think it's more about the life that he lived, the vision that he had for his life to make Jesus more, to make much of him, to make much of God, and less of himself. I think, man, do I have a vision for that? For my life? At the end of my life, when I'm whittling a stick on my porch, thinking about everything that I've done, am I going to be able to tell stories about how Jesus moved in and through me? Am I going to have a vision like John? It says, Jesus was much and I was little. What am I going to be known for? As John was known as being the baptizer. And so, I really thought about certain things in my life. And it's not an exhaustive list, okay? I'm too ADD to add any more to this list. <laughs> but this is what I came up for myself. This is not for you. Maybe you can take a few of these things and think about it for yourself. But I really want to challenge you this week. Think about what the, what the vision of your life is. When you're old and you're looking backwards instead of forward, and you're remembering your life, what do you want to be known for? So here's some things that I have to do. I have to break it down into an everyday thing. Okay, every day I want to connect with God. I gotta connect with God. I want His Word to fall on me fresh. I want to hear from God. I, I, I want His Word to penetrate my heart and change the way I live. I gotta talk to God. Because I've got a lot to talk to God about. There's a lot going on in my life. There's a lot going on in our world. I can't go a day without talking to God. I need to connect with God. Maybe some of you guys have a best friend, a BFFTTE, best friend forever to the end. Maybe that's your spouse. <laughs> You've got someone you love. And if you don't connect with them, you feel like you lost a day. That's how I am with God. I've got to meet with God every day, somehow, some way. I've got to love my family well. I mean, that's what I want to do. It's not my obligation, it's my joy. I want to love my family well. I don't always do that. I act out of anger. I lash out. I am forgetful. I live with four ladies. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> but I want to love my family well. I want them to know that I care about them. Not only do I want to love God and love my family, I really want to turn from sin. I mean, I know what you're thinking. I'm, I'm on stage and I'm a pastor, and it, it looks like I should have a lot of my life together. But even this morning at 6.05, as I'm getting out of my driveway to go pick up the trailer set up church this morning with an awesome group of guys and gals, I said, God, I'm so undeserving of this, but thank you. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. And there's so many areas of my life that are just not where I want them to be. But you care about me anyway. And you still use me. And you've got a plan for my life. And I want to repent from sin. I don't just want to accept that part of my life. I want you to expose it to me, make it real to me, and then let me turn from it every single day. Because if I don't, I'll just become numb to it. I'll be the frog in the water that's put on the stove that comes to a boiling point, and I'll sit the whole time until it takes my life. We can become numb to sin and its effects when we don't repent from it and confess it to God. I want to share Christ. If you know me, I get excited about a couple of things. 
besides my family and church, right? You know, chocolate chip cookies and sharing Christ. Okay, if, if I get a chance to tell somebody about Jesus, like last Sunday after a message of rejection, where I had to wipe off my toes, I met a new neighbor, and I, I got to share Christ with my neighbor and talk to my friend about Jesus. If I hear a story about you sharing Christ with someone, I got to tell someone about Jesus, you're going to see my face light up and the smile get bigger and bigger. Because this is the most important message to me, Jesus. And I want to share Christ as much as I can, as often as I can, either verbally or with my actions, living my life out in front of people, showing them who Jesus is. We've got to share Christ. I want to be generous. Okay? I don't want to be known as the stingy guy. I'm already stingy enough. Just a few weeks ago, my wife and I went on a date, and we went to Scarpa's and a movie, right? And so we went, and it cost us, I think, $2, because we had a gift card to Scarpa's and a gift card to the movies. It's glorious. You might think, well, that's really lame of you. Can't you take your wife out somewhere nice on your own dollar? No, that actually got my wife really happy. <laughs> Using a discount and a card, right? And so we're at the restaurant and the waitress comes up to me and she says, excuse me, are you Jared Bridge? I said, well, <laughs> yes I am. <laughs> yes, I am Glad of you to notice. <laughs> and she was actually a former teenager in a student ministry here in town at Hoffmantown Church. I said, are, are you Casey? She said, yeah, I'm Casey. Oh, I remember you. Wow, because she was a kid and now she's like an adult serving and recognize her. And at the end of our $2 meal, because the gift card covered all of it, I gave a $10 tip. Right? I could have given 20 cents. But no, because I don't want to be known as that cheapskate pastor. <laughs> I want to be generous. Because when she says, hey, I ran in to Jared, he came in and sat down, and he left this gigantic tip, and he didn't have to. I mean, I, I want to be known as someone who gives more than he takes. I've got to be active, okay? That's something that's important to me. It might not be as important to you, but I go stir crazy. I'm ADD in here, so if it doesn't get out some way, it's trouble, okay? I love being active, whether it's walking with my family or going for a run or lifting some weights or playing a sport. I say, okay, you know what? If I can focus on these things every single day, I think that maybe, just maybe, I could live like John the Baptist, where my life is centered and directed towards God, and it influences all aspects of my life. And when that moment comes, where push comes to shove, and I have to stand up for what's right and speak out, I'll be ready, because I've lived a life dedicated to God. So for us here this morning, can that be said about each of us? That we have a vision, that we have an aim, that we have a game plan for our life? Or are we just kind of aimlessly wandering, hoping we'll figure it out along the way? May today be a day that you follow the life of John the Baptist that's willing to do the risky, maybe even sacrifice the precious so that you can live for God and that his name will be made much of as a result of your life. God, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we're thankful for this story of John the Baptist. And He lived probably a much shorter life than he could have, or some would say even should have. He fell at the hands of evil people. But Lord, he didn't waver from you. He always followed you, and he pointed others to you. And so, God, well, none of us here desire to die a martyr's death such as John the Baptist, but we do desire to live a life like his, one that's exclusively dedicated to you. And, Lord, may we do that. If we do, we know that it will impact and it will infiltrate all areas of our life, that it will take over our finances, it will take over our relationships, it will take over our work ethic. That, Lord, if we live our life for you, you'll take care of the rest. And, God, maybe there's some here today that have never given their life over to you, and they feel a little lost and aimless. And today, they've been inspired by 
your word. And Lord, that this could be the moment that they get things right with you. They've known for a really long time that their life has been out of whack and out of alignment and they feel a little lost and aimless. But today that they could come to you and say, God, I need direction from you for my life. God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe in your son, Jesus, who died on a cross for me to forgive me of my sin and to give me a hope for today. Lord, I commit my life to you and I invite your spirit to come live in me and take up residence in my life and take over. In Jesus' name.